Hello and welcome to the eTalking podcast. My name is Stuart Garlick and I'm from eMotion, the website for Formula E and electric vehicle news. Now, on this edition of the podcast, you're going to hear a conversation between myself, Hazel Southwell, um, a freelance journalist who specialises in Formula E and electric vehicles, who came with me on a road test to Estonia, in which we drove a Nissan Leaf E Plus to the island of Hiumaa the full podcast of which you can hear in the previous edition. Uh, Steph Schrader, who is a freelance journalist from Texas, who specialises in hooning Porsches around the Nürburgring and other race circuits, and who also went for a test in a Tesla Model 3 recently, so shares her details of that. Conrad O'Keefe, Formula E journalist from eRacing.net, and Daniel Milford, who is a Norwegian who drives drives a Nissan Leaf and works in the electric vehicle sector of the Norwegian government for a living. So it's interesting to hear his viewpoint on things. And uh, with that, let's get on with the show. We we sort of um, took the Leaf to settings where you don't necessarily think about, because the thing that everyone says about EVs is like, oh, well, you wouldn't want to take it on a road trip to a remote island (laughs) because like you might run out of juice. Um, it was a very high-end leaf. It was a very modern leaf. Um, so it wasn't quite like banging a 2011 one round uh, with a knackered battery. But nevertheless, um, uh, we uh, yeah, we, we took it around this island um, and partook of some Estonian culture, uh, like the Smoked Fish and Beer Festival. Um, mm. what, one type that. of beer, many types of smoked fish. <laughs> Oh. oh my gosh! Yes, I, I think they even had fish jerky there, didn't they? Mm. Mm. It, it was oh. it was it was one of those things. Um, now uh, this this is proper rural stuff. They had an umpire band, and most crucially, they had a man on the tannoy who was enjoying himself very much. <laughs> it was his party, and we were merely in attendance. <laughs> this guy, um, uh, I have never heard anyone love shouting like so there's a full umpa <laughs> band like like really like classic kind of like thumping germanic semi slavic kind of music um including some umpa covers of ed sheeran which is something i oh, never no. really considered um oh, no. but I, I mean you've been at the nordschleife steph i'm i'm sure you've you've heard this mm-hmm. kind of music um and uh, Awful, yes <laughs> yeah i mean it's it was actually a relief every time there was umpa because it was probably like 50 or 60 decibels quieter than just the guy on the PA. It was really, really quite something. Um, but yeah, then then we were driving a very quiet car. <laughs> so. So, so we had time to relieve the ringing of our eardrums by driving the car. Um, <laughs> Although uh, for legal reasons uh, and because it's true, I've got to point out we didn't drive the car that evening. No, we didn't. No, no, yeah. Um, no, we oh. got the the one taxi on humour, mm. um, both ways. Uh, but uh, yes, um, so yeah, we 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 were kind of. I uh, normally we called it sort of a road test, but um, obviously a little bit of it was uh, seeing how handy the leaf is. Most of humour is um, what the leaf kept telling us: warning, unsurfaced road. Um, uh, so yeah, it, it was. It definitely wasn't sort of people associate. Oh, EVs are really fun to drive around cities. Um, they're very good for like short journeys. They've got like all of this instant talk and stuff. But if you're going around a like long winding road through some really thick uh, silver birch forests, or like just in the middle of some quite sinister pagan monuments yes. in. Estonia uh like this big pile of sort of uh, assembled branches which when we got close enough said pull the shoes and make a wish and there were like a pair of shoes and you could like pull it and it clacked and that kind of all, all quite wicker man stuff um wow which is definitely the kind of place where you're like mm, i don't really want to run out of electricity here <laughs> <laughs> this, this would feel yeah. real bad like there's no street lights um there's not a huge number of people there's not a huge number of settlements and even though the island isn't that big um it, it definitely it was like 
I can you get anxious about rain or how anxious can you get about range in this car was kind of something that we wanted to um, explore because I always is, insist there isn't range anxiety um, with EVs that, that most of Europe you don't need to consider it and and certainly I mean with this one I think we might have been able to get away without charging it at all we actually did but um, which for three days of, of pretty much driving certainly driving every day and, and driving for the majority of the day every day um, is pretty impressive now, Daniel, along with uh, Steph and Hazel, have donated to my Patreon. If you'd like to contribute to my Patreon, then you get the chance to get exclusive articles. Uh, you get the chance to take part in the eTalking podcast in the future. And um, there are also other goodies, such as exclusive chats with me before and after Formula E races. So it's definitely worth subscribing to and you will, I think, enjoy the exclusive stuff that you get there. Uh, again, it's patreon.com forward slash E underscore motion FE. Subscription packages start at only $1 per month. Yes, and uh, the other thing I thought was impressive was that uh, the charging infrastructure is almost perfect in Estonia. I mean... There are chargers that are out of order from place to place, but uh, generally the ABB chargers are fast chargers, and um, you know they're they're usually where you'd expect them to be. They're, they're next to a village shop or or a petrol station usually, but uh, uh, even on that uh, even on that relatively small island that you could get get around in an hour and a half uh, on the ring road, there were still four charging stations. So uh, I, I think it shows how small countries that begin with not much infrastructure can um, get it pretty quickly through just ingenious thinking really um, as as we've discussed before the thing that was not so great was the actual restaurant infrastructure on the island it's it's almost like uh, <laughs> it, it's almost like technology got ahead of entertainments really as far as people's yeah. uh, people's thinking went and yeah you 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 could charge the leaf any time of day like you would never really much further than like eight or nine kilometers from a, a fast charger if you really pushed it um uh but could you get dinner no. uh, to to get back to the leaf like i mean obviously estonia is a small country estonia is a small country with with pretty good electricity infrastructure um so like even on who am I, like everywhere does have electricity it's it's not um especially remote in that respect actually uh, we stopped at a windmill uh just because it was like near the side of the road mm. and the, the the like flavor text on the um the kind of like tourist information board next to it was explaining that it's a historic windmill or whatever uh but apparently there was at one point and i quite like this because this is like the kind of charmingly weird thing people think about wind power now um they said there were so many windmills on Huima, the, the this Baltic island, um, that there was not enough wind to power them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um which actually to be fair, the flatness definitely will have helped us with extending the battery. Um and the fact that it had the E pedal so it was regenerating quite a lot and there was um a lot of uh, yeah, so uh, like yeah. Um it's I, I a lot of EVs you would have needed to charge more. I think you would have been quite able to, but you would have needed to. Um, the uh, the thing I, I think is quite interesting, um, and I wonder if this is something that, like, Steph with the Tesla, um, especially if you were in the passenger seat, um, mm -hmm. like, you might have noticed this, because when you're in an EV, the thing I noticed um, about the Leaf is obviously Huimar is a remote island. It doesn't have like a lot of um, people around. It doesn't have a lot of background noise. It doesn't have a lot of stuff going on. And you're mostly surrounded by nature and forests and things. And I really noticed that like absent of engine noise, aside from the fact that like wildlife didn't skitter away. So like animals didn't leave like it. I felt much more connected to the outside than I do in a normal wow. car. Hmm. Yeah, definitely. I and... fell asleep. <laughs> 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 I 
I, so uh, it was not exciting yeah. then. <laughs> well, it was very quiet in the Model 3. Um, but I think they also have a lot of sound deadening and, and such to make it kind of isolate speaker noise. Or not the speaker noise, the uh, outside noise. And uh, I'm real bad about if I'm a passenger um, falling asleep if I am not, like, actively, or anywhere I sit, really, if I am not, like, doodling or taking notes or writing something or fidgeting, I'm going to fall asleep. And the Tesla passed the test. <laughs> it was late at night. We were going to dinner. I fell right asleep. It was beautiful. It was a very comfortable place to sleep. And, uh, yeah. But driving it, I mostly heard uh, kind of that, that – electric engine spool up well not engine obviously what's the word i'm looking for power the, the train. motor sounds powertrain mm. yes there we go um i work in words i swear <laughs> 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 um yeah the um it was mostly that and you know some tire noise i didn't hear a whole lot of nature though um mm. And I don't know if it's just like it was very quiet and most of I got to drive it in rural Germany for a little a short little loop. And there's not much to hear. <laughs> it's kind of so nice. Do, so does, does that appeal to you or um, having spent years uh, driving the uh, loudest, most desirable ICE cars, um, do, do you crave the engine noise still? No, not really. Um, I do if he's moving the car, um, cause I do like, I, I do like that they're kind of mandating noises at low speeds cause that gets a little weird. Um, the idea of sneaking up on somebody in your car though, kind of appeals to me, <laughs> but isn't very practical from a safety standpoint. Um, but you wouldn't be able to do that in the leaf because it would probably it, it would start telling you oh God. and then it would start telling everyone around you that you were getting like within 15 beep, feet of beep, another beep, object beep, beep, beep. yeah yeah exactly uh, there was actually a moment where we were getting off the car ferry and i mm -hmm. thought the battery had derated uh because um which is a word that you taught me actually uh because you said mitch evans's mm. battery derated at the end of the last race anyway so i thought the battery mm. had derated because the um, the engine uh, sorry the engine the, the power unit just stopped and um, I, I got in a massive panic because I thought someone was going to run into the back of me. Turns out it, it engaged the emergency brake because it thought I was going to drive into the car in front in, on the ferry. So uh, mm. incredibly sensitive. And as, as you said in the podcast, peculiarly sentient as well, wasn't it? Yeah, like, like it definitely because I've my complaint about Teslas in the past has been that like they they have this ipad in the dashboard yeah. that like drives me personally nuts as an interface um give me some dials like it it turns out i can't cope um i have sweaty hands uh and um <laughs> the the they're always like telling you messages and like talking to you and like all kinds of things um but in a way that feels much or felt much more to me with the what was it a p100 DL or something I don't know um yeah. it, it wasn't it sounds right yeah um it, it was a few years old Tesla um it felt like receiving messages from Tesla Central <laughs> rather than the leaf <laughs> properly it mm -hmm. felt like it was like uh don't do that <laughs> like like the leaf itself was really quite um and these were all systems you can turn off in it uh, but we mm -hmm. didn't because because they'd been turned on by the dealership and, and that was the point of us test driving mm -hmm. it. But um, yeah, it, I, I think there's a sort of there's a balance between the two. So like the Tesla is relatively non intrusive, but I found it a bit like all staff emails. Um, <laughs> <laughs> whereas the Leaf was much more like, hey, I'm talking to you. Um, but at the same time, hey, I was like, oh my God, calm Listen. down. <laughs> it's your friend the leaf i i'm doing this for your own good like just just listen to me <laughs> shoes do not match pants y yeah. yes it, yeah. it, 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 exactly <laughs> that yeah in, in fact um can 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 i steal that for the review please steph yes thank yes. you 
Please um, do. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll put you in the footnotes. Thank you. Um, but, but yeah, I, I would agree with everything both of you said, actually. Um, mm -hmm. I've, I've, I've never driven a Tesla, uh, but the sense I get is that they do not feel personal in the sense that this car felt um, to me and to us. Uh, it, it, it felt like uh, it was... Um, I, I think it's putting it too strongly to say it evolved to my driving. I think I evolved to its uh, desired driving by just not hitting any white lines and going mm -hmm. really slowly and slowing down for speed limits, I think. Huh. This idea of a, a car feeling personal just feels weirdly foreign to me because the car is the thing that I I abuse for fun. <laughs> and I, <laughs> momentous career sinking kind of way um i mean i'm used to like sharpying on the gauge pod in the 944 you shift here or we have an uncomfortable conversation um and and just having no mechanical sympathy so this idea of, of the car is this character that that's your buddy through the interface design is really it's really interesting. I, it's something I've never really thought of before. I, I usually just like to think of, you know, are the, the buttons in a logical place? Um, were there buttons in the leaf? I haven't gotten to drive a leaf yet. Uh, there, Some there, of them. There were buttons, yeah. There, there was like a flappy yeah. button thing for the e-pedal and that kind of thing. Um, the e-pedal will come on to in a moment, uh, by the way, when we bring in Daniel on this. But, uh, Ooh. yeah. Um, so uh, <laughs> th there was there was plenty to press. Um, but I... Um, as as we've only got Hazel for a few more minutes, I just want to, mm -hmm. I, I I just I just want to ask really, what what were your overall impressions of the trip? You said that it didn't stretch the limits of the leaf very much, but uh, did you feel the, like 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 uh, like you personally learned something about the car and about uh, driving it and about range and all that kind of business? I I mean I would say it it certainly pushed the limits of what I think I expected the leaf to do. Um, so I I did even being quite comfortable with the size of battery and range that EVs have, I expected it to not get as far as it did. Um, I expected to be more worried about it. Um, even even though I'm really like an advocate for like, you really don't need to worry about this. It's just not a thing. Um, and then like, I, uh, yeah, I, I did expect to worry. Um, uh, I... I was surprised, I was a little bit surprised by, so to pick back up on what Steph just said, I was actually quite surprised by the sentience. So normally I'm a bit like, about things that talk to me, like I, I don't have an Amazon Echo, I switch off Google Voice on my phone as soon as I humanly can. Um, I, I really don't like that as an interface. It's partly because I've got hearing damage and partly just because I find it really <laughs> creepy. Um, and because it's always women's voices and it's always like a bit weird and subservient. Um, I quite like that the leaf was actually quite sort of stroppy with us. <laughs> it was sort of, um, uh, which did give it weirdly like a lot more. That's definitely the fact that it was getting ticked off with us was definitely kind of um, where the sentient kind of uh, sense came in. Um, and I, I was surprised I liked it, but I, th I, I think if, I'd had it any longer I would have definitely turned all those things off mm. um because I agree with Steph like especially the first leaves the those early leaves had almost they were like an EV with none of the programming so obviously they are heavily programmed all cars are um but like a 2011 leaf or a, a first gen leaf when it first appeared was like if you put all of the torque into in the world into a Fiat Punto like it didn't go especially fast and it was like kind of made of plastic mm. like and it felt like it was made of plastic but because of that it was just like this hoonable thing it, it was just like something where you just press the pedal and you were like god um and it had all yeah. that excitement and the the mm. coolness of a punto or like a really tiny car in that respect um whereas this felt much more like Ooh, leaves are grown up now. Like it's got all this stuff, and it, obviously it was the very high end one. So I suspect that there is still a Gen Two leaf with a bigger battery, with all of the the advantages of this um, edition, um, but that's a, a little bit less 
sort of luxury this this felt like it was kind of edging towards the more kind of tesla end of things um whereas i'm very much more about the um direct drive and let's hope you know what speed it's going <laughs> um and how much batteries left element of of kind of earlier evs in terms of like what is pure fun like if i could bang a 2011 re- uh, leaf round snetterton or that leaf i don't know which one i'd go for because that leaf would probably get real mad at me if i did anything <laughs> bad but i could probably do at least like five times as many laps so um yeah it's it's a i i was very interested in it um I think I think definitely um definitely that that scenario it's the scenario that everyone talks about is well what are you going to do with the car when you go on holiday can you drive across a country can you, you do whatever can you drive for a whole day and like honestly yes you definitely can now like that oh no doubt that I thought was the was sort of the most interesting element of it because that's always the scenario that people put in as the gotcha for EVs. They're like, well, it's fine for every day, but what if you have to do this thing that you never do anyway? Um, <laughs> but like, uh, yeah, that that was pretty interesting. Um, and I think also, and and it was interesting to me that I didn't even as somebody who writes about electric vehicles, writes about the technology of electric vehicles, um, writes a lot about range anxiety and and charging and that kind of thing. And even knowing that we had good charging infrastructure around, I was worried about it, like for for no purpose, because it was fine. And also I knew it was going to be fine. Um, But yeah, sort of that it seeped into my head in that respect. Uh, but I think I think it should be taken as reassuring that yeah there was absolutely no problem at all. I think we would have had about eight percent left if we hadn't charged it by the time we got back. But I think we would have. Um, yeah, probably. I think we could have uh, we, we could have just about got it home. Um, and um, yeah, uh, possibly the fact that we were driving a top of the range car means that this was not a completely fair test of uh, <clears throat> um, the sort of car that the man, on, man or woman on the street would buy uh, from the dealership um, as is. And um, but I felt like as an indicator of the sort of range and performance you could get from a Leaf, it was a reasonable test. The, the, the only thing is. Um, that um, it was chock full of features. I think it had some extra downforce, and uh, definitely it had uh, a much bigger battery than the base model. So, uh, would you say it was still a fair test of the Leaf Ranger's capabilities? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, for sure. Because also it had all kinds of things like um, traction control and stuff that like um, wouldn't be draining a a low lower end car's battery. Um, I think given the huge margins that we had in terms of battery, like the point where we decided we should probably charge it, it was on like 40 or something. It was, um, yeah, 30%, yeah. Yeah, so it, it, was, it wasn't It was like we were on 1% and we were thinking, oh God, if we, did it, if we weren't right next to a fast charger now, you know, um, I think we still would have made it fine. Um, it's It's probably a case of like, we might have made the choice to do it the previous day rather than the day we did. Um, but I don't, I don't think um, like, cause the first night we stayed somewhere with no electricity hmm. or, no, or no plug that we could use. Um, yes. And I genuinely got like the nerves. Cause I was like, well, we've driven here and now we should plug it in overnight. Oh my God. Like, like it's my phone. You see, I, I didn't sense that. I thought I thought you were okay with it. Uh, no, I'm I'm just like, I, I mean, I I say I I thought that like hmm. intellectually, I knew we had like eighty one percent battery or something, eight eighty nine percent battery, whatever it was. So like, I knew we didn't actually need to, but like in the back of my head, I was like, oh, I need to do this. Um, and yeah, I think. Um, I don't know. I, I'm I'm sure like looking at, at that kind of thing, looking at, at road trips that bigger trips like steps around Germany and, and stuff mm-hmm. um, that people do in the EVs. It has to be something that can 
can certainly um, start to address this stuff like range anxiety. Like I think documenting this stuff can, has to be helpful because actually just a lot of people are like, well, how would I drive an EV? Because they don't know. <laughs> so, mm. yeah. Um, right. So I, I think I think that we I think that we learnt a lot, but uh, you know if if I can possibly uh, if, if I can possibly remember how to write in English, then uh, hopefully I'll be able to communicate something to people as well. And uh, I uh, look look forward to um, uh, re- re- reading your eventual uh, write up on it as well. Um, Hazel, I did say I'd let you go, so thank you very much. But um, yeah, re- really appreciate you coming over to Estonia for the weekend as well, and uh, I um, hope that you enjoyed it. Um, Right, so um, you, you've all listened to our road trip story there. Um, mm-hmm. S- Steph, how does that compare to driving around Germany? Obviously, it's a much smaller space, but uh, did you feel well, that you not really. did, did you feel that you learnt uh, you learnt something more from your drive around Germany? Well, so it wasn't just around Germany. Um, the guy with the Tesla Model Three lives in Frankfurt, so that's kind of where a lot of us set off from. Um, I shared a rental car with. Um, another American that was on the trip. Um, basically, what we were doing was every year the final gear forums. That remember where you went to go pirate Top Gear still has a forum, still does an annual meet at the Nurburgring, and for the past few years they've been doing a road trip beforehand. So they planned a loop through, um, kind of starting in Austria and going into Italy and Switzerland and kind of ping-ponging over the Alps. And so (laughs) that, I think, made it a little more impressive that, you know, we had a Model 3 on the trip, and his stops weren't that out of the way or, um, like, I guess punitive is maybe the word I'm looking for. Like Mm. they weren't like a a big drag on the rest of us. Um, By the time the rest of us, you know, we were in a group of, I'd say 10 cars, eight cars. I don't know. I would have to like look at pictures and count and that's more effort than I'm willing to do right now. Um, But you know, a, a sizable group of cars, by the time we all finished, you know, Fueling up, because a lot of the a lot of the fast charging stations were close to gas stations. Um, by the time we finished fueling up, getting snacks, pooping, fixing stuff, uh, standing around doing nothing, you know the usual like stop on a road trip. His car was done charging, and you know full up, ready to go. Uh, it was really pretty interesting, and especially with the mountain passes, because a lot of it, um, he would just leave regenerative on one of the higher settings, uh, regenerative mm. braking. Mm. And so he'd recuperate a lot of energy just going down the road. Um, and so we saw some really incredible places, <laughs> and I was really impressed with that car. I'm like, maybe I should like can i borrow a taycan when that comes out because <laughs> clearly you can do it and you know there were only a couple places that we ran into where the plug was closed or it was like a pay plug for an exorbitant amount or whatever but i mean even our stops at the end of the night i mean obviously you found the exception on your trip with the leaf but mm. you know worst case scenario you find a plug and you run an extension cord right it and slow charge it overnight so it was all pretty interesting i'm i'm really impressed with the amount of infrastructure kind of in in that central europe area um i'm really curious how it would compare to a trip in america because i know infrastructure is in our our biggest (laughs) <laughs> so to say um but yeah i was really impressed with that thing and, and again it's a completely quiet car that had enough torque to knock the sunglasses off my head when i got to finally take her drive <laughs> so that, that's that's superb and did, did you get a chance to engage ludicrous mode as well um no i mean it was someone else's car that you know had to make it home so not really 
Um, we did all cram in. We crammed five people in for a lap around the Nurburgring. Someone else is driving. Um, well, actually, this is where so there were two Teslas on the trip. <laughs> okay. Um, one joined up at the Nurburgring itself. It was a Model S. It went into limp mode about halfway around, so it was kind of slow. Um, and I, that's something I'd kind of, I think is like the next step of, okay, so you've got these performance EVs. Can they make it one lap around the Nürburgring finally? <laughs> yeah. Um, I, this is something even Formula E wrestles with. Uh, they are mm -hmm. constantly revising the, uh, length of the races season on season based on, mm -hmm. uh, uh, what, what will give an energy challenge to the cars. So it's, it's interesting to mm -hmm. hear that, uh, uh, road EVs, uh, people have the same question. Uh, will it get round the entire Nordschleifer? And um, of, of course, of course, it did. So that proved a point, didn't it? Well, it didn't get around. I mean, this was an earlier Model S that we all crammed into. I think the I can't remember how the Model Three fared, but I think it ran into some of the same issues where it would go into kind of a a toned down mode to let everything cool off. Um, it's just the, the cooling systems aren't there. So I, I remember when the Model S first came out, people were really excited about them. People would take them on Coda and discover that they have, you know, most of their power cut, you know, obviously still enough power to limp back into the pits, but it's, it's kind of a fun killing thing when you, bought a performance car and it suddenly goes into limp mode so i kind of think that's the next thing they should work on <laughs> <laughs> but other than that it was fantastic <laughs> okay well uh, let's let's throw it out to our two other guests so um uh, mm -hmm. D daniel first of all um we talked a lot about the performance of evs but uh, you're, you're a leaf owner yourself um so um does um, do either of our recollections ring a bell with you or um, ha have have you ever thought about your car as a performance tool or are you more interested in what it can do in terms of A to B? <laughs> it's not a performance tool and it's anything but sentient. Uh, Hazel mentioned the, the plastic Punto version of the Leaf and that's the one I have. I have the, the first generation 2012 Leaf. So it's yeah. definitely an A to B car but it accelerates really well so it's still fun to ride. Mm -hmm. Sure. And um, uh, do, do, you, do you get range anxiety? Uh, in the beginning, I, I did. I can uh, understand what Hazel is saying about your trip to Estonia because it takes experience to just to know the car and what it's good for. Uh, I drive a lot, of course, uh, in, in Norway where, where there are a lot of rapid chargers, at least along the, the national transport corridors, say the, the, the big roads. But I also drive like in rural Norway, apart from the main roads. And there you really have to know what you're doing because there's not just to pull out an extension cord wherever you are. You could be in the middle of a forest. So, uh, yeah, you do know the about the range anxiety at first. So I uh, I bought for, for my Leaf, you have the Leaf Spy app. I don't know if you know it, but it's this expensive and homemade looking app. I don't know it. Yeah, and then you buy this uh, this dongle to put into the OBD2 port right below the steering wheel. It's like a di diagnostics port, which make, lets you see how much battery you actually have left, not the lie that the car tells you in the dashboard. So this has helped me a lot because I can drive further than what the car tells me I can drive. So I'm going, uh, you can go past the zero kilometers, <laughs> as it were, well, that's, and it starts that's... blinking. That's really interesting. Um, the guy at the dealership told me that uh, after you get to 0% battery, there is actually uh, about 20 kilometers of crawling pace battery left. Is, is, that, is that your experience as well? Uh, I think you might actually have more because the, the crawling pace is when it goes into turtle mode. And it doesn't go into turtle mode un, uh, until after it hits a bit after 0%. Uh, percent. Hmm. Hmm. And um, in, in, term, in terms of the uh, roads you get to drive, obviously Norway is peppered with uh, beautiful mountain roads and uh, tunnels under fjords and all that business. Uh, do, 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 you ha do you have some beauty to look at on your home commute? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, 
last winter I had a, a long drive going through the Norwegian uh, main mountain pass, uh, which was an exciting trip because again, this is the first generation Leaf, so it has a, a 24 kilowatt hours of worth of battery. And so I drove, I think it was 450 kilometers. And then you don't have to think about range anxiety, but maybe just time anxiety because it takes a lot of time. I rapid charged 11 times on that one trip okay just to get there um right uh, and um your 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 de- your day job of course is uh, is is for a uh, government uh, agency that uh, works with evs in some way maybe you can tell us more about that yeah it's the, i think the closest british equivalent would perhaps be the energy saving trust only we're only uh, publicly funded so among other things we issue state funding for the building of rapid charges throughout the country so we have helped establish the charges that are spread out uh, the national transport corridors that i mentioned hmm. and why is norway so uh, all in with electric cars uh, what do you think the reason is why the whole country has got behind them so much uh, well, every country have, has to deal with their climate, uh, their, their emissions, right? And so the Norwegian energy system is uh, mostly renewable or like 98% renewable because of the hydropower and, and some some wind. So the, the job we have to do is within the transport sector because that's where we have the, the, the pollution. So that's where, where the, the government puts its, uh, its work in. And of course, we are early adopters in in many fields when it comes to technology we uh, it's a, well it's a rather rich country you know we, we found oil in the 70s and never looked back so there's 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 money to be to be spent on these kinds of things wonderful uh steph you were going to say something jump in feel free oh no i was just uh nodding along like oh. hey hey okay um. okay cool <laughs> have, have, you, have you been to norway have you driven the roads i have not Although uh, the Model S we we ran around the Nurburgring was from Norway, and so like huh. a lot of this kind of doesn't surprise me. They, I'm kind of jealous of the the amount they spend on clean infrastructure and, and such, and you know, that's pretty. Yeah, cool. and it's not, it's not just cars, you know. It's it's ferries and it's buses. Mm-hmm. So yeah, yeah. I need um, to go to Norway. Conrad, Conrad, you've been patiently listening to um, to to everyone talking about their electric car experiences during this podcast. Um, have you ever driven an electric car? And if if not, uh, does this does this discussion motivate you to go out and get one? Yeah, this is part of why I've been so quiet. Partly because uh, the stories have been very interesting, and I've kind of just been listening along as a fan. But also, I've not driven any car, like let alone an electric one. So. I definitely would love to in the future. One that I would really, well, even a subsection that I'd really love to drive is um, classic converts with electric powertrains. Oh, yeah. Just right. imagine a, a, a Porsche three five six or a Jaguar E Type with an electric powertrain, and I reckon it'd make it so much better. Well, this is something I was going to ask because uh, Steph, you're obviously you're obviously the authority on uh, old Porsches, um, but. Uh-huh. How, how do you feel about uh, the essence of the car being scraped out and replaced by a powertrain? Is it okay? Ooh. Um, so it's tricky because I, a car is, is something that should bring you joy and happiness and, and make your life better. Like, we tend to think of them more as, you know, kinds of almost an extension of ourselves in some way over at least on the enthusiast end, um, over just, you know, the thing that gets us places. So I don't know if, if it makes you happy to do that. Yeah. Um, I would prefer that spare parts go to someone trying to keep one alive, um, in its original form. It always like, I always kind of cringe when somebody does this like awesome heretical swap. that's going to make all the Porsche forums angry. Because uh, I love doing that. <laughs> and, <laughs> and uh, you know, and then they, uh, you know, end up scrapping the parts or selling them off. Or, it, you know, it's it's hard enough to find old car parts that, you know, I'm very much for if, if what makes you happy is kind of preserving that historical vehicle in its original form. 
I think there's room for that along with, you know, crazy EV swaps and things. Um, I would recommend maybe shoring up the frame of the 356 to be, you know, capped mm-hmm. it obvious. Don't don't twist the 356 apart with torque, please. <laughs> mm. But but please. <laughs> <laughs> I love this stuff. Yeah. And um <sighs> What what about uh, the more modern generation of Porsches? I mean, uh, obviously we'll, we'll get onto the uh, Taycan or Taycan in a minute, but uh, um, do, do you class the Macan and the K and, and the Cayenne as actually being Porsches? Because they're both front engined and they're both self evidently mm-hmm. four by fours. Yeah, they're they are Porsches. they are Porsches. Yeah, they are definitely this, Porsches. This is a really interesting one because. I've noticed it a lot when I talk to um, fans of classic cars and fans of Porsches, is that they always seem to classify it as it really, really should be rear-engined. There's there's two points that's uh, that I usually bring up in these conversations is that one the without the Cayenne, yeah, uh, that's my second point. But the uh, first point is without the Cayenne and the Macan, which uh, are, you know like are the chief income earners for Porsche nowadays. Mm-hmm. Like you'd have to think it wouldn't be half as profitable if uh, they just had the 911 and old supercars like the um, Carrera GT, if they were mainly just relying on that. So if we get to get the the really good stuff like those cars, then I'm happy to have a Cayenne and a Macan, which are good cars in the run, right? And you they get ho- you can see them be hooned about like proper Porsches, and yeah. also. I mean, think of the Boxster. That's a proper Porsche, and that's mid-engine, so is the Cayman. The Cayman GT4, one mm-hmm. of the best cars of all time. Car reviewers rate it as. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, I'd love to drive one of those as well. So, I, so, yeah. so, so, so in a way, the, um, the, the, the essence of Porsche is not necessarily rear-engine cars. It's, it's something bigger, you would say, Conrad. It's something a lot finer. There's a special magic to Porsches in a similar way that you get with Ferraris. You know what? how it's hard to describe with a Ferrari because it goes beyond the barge, it goes beyond the red paint. There's just something Ferrari-like. Porsches have that similar special sauce, if you will. Mm. I really can't think of a better way to phrase it, but it's just something about it. Like You could take the badges off and you could put it in a different car style, but there'll be little things you notice about it that make you think <laughs> this this could well be a Porsche. Well, and uh, you mentioned taking the badges off. Of course, uh, Por- Porsche has possibly the largest number of um, coach-built uh, brands that, you- that use the chassis design uh, without uh, uh, obviously being Porsches. So I'm thinking of Roof and Singer in particular, mm-hmm. but also many others. Yeah. Um, uh, Roof do a lot more. I mean, th- there's somewhere they just look like literal rebadges of other cars, but I mean, thanks to Ruff, I got to drive them in Gran Turismo, so I'm quite happy for that. Uh, yeah, of course, um, because for, for many years, the only reason any of us knew Ruff was because uh, Porsche wouldn't license the cars to the games. That's exactly <laughs> how I knew them. <laughs> it, it was the same in uh, Forza Horizon 2 as well. Um, uh, there, there, there was there was a Ruff 911, but not a Porsche 911. Um, but uh, yeah, so so Conrad, you would say that uh, those, um, those um, uh, specialist coach building brands um would do the while obviously not building porsches and they'll give you a slap if you say that they do um would you say they have the essence of porsche somehow i mean i think i'd risk the slap to be honest they are porsches but <laughs> sorry i'm i'm 20 years old and my voice is still breaking <laughs> but um <laughs> uh yeah i think I'll, I'll risk that slap but I, I, I wouldn't if i were in their position i wouldn't be slapping anyone about it because if someone said to me your car's incredibly like a Porsche, but it's faster. I'd be like, so I've already got a absolutely brilliant design, absolutely brilliantly well-made car, and I've made it quicker and potentially more exciting to drive, hmm. Make, making it a genuine contender for one of the greatest cars around. I attended the uh, the Nordic EV Summit earlier this year, and there was a uh, uh, they had a, a talk. Porsche, and they called it Taycan themselves. Oh, okay. Khan as the guy from Star Trek. Yeah. All right. So uh, did you get to see it close up? And what was your impression, Daniel? No, the car wasn't there. They just held a talk. Ah, okay. (laughs) Um, 
because uh, the, the, the Porsche E concept, I think it was called, or something like that, came out a few years ago. And it Mission E. Um, that's the one. Looked yeah. absolutely mm -hmm. spectacular. This is very much a vanilla, watered-down version of that styling, isn't it? I don't, I don't think so. I mean, it's it's a little road carized, a little less like you know you're not going to get like the big concept wheels because those won't work in reality. You will curb them immediately uh, getting out of the dealership's driveway. Um, but it looks like they kept a lot of like the funky uh, front end styling seems to be there. Um, they, they've been running ones with stickers, and I think it was um, Johnny, is it Johnny Smith that that was on uh, Fifth Gear for Ever and Ever? I think um, so. He did, he did a video on the Taycan a while back, and actually, like, they had it there. It was slightly camouflaged to look like a Panamera, but, you know, he even, like, put his hands over some of the stickers and, like, look it's it looks like this and so i think it's going to be a little it, it's i'm i'm happy with how it it's probably going to look it looks like it's going to be kind of cool it is is it fair to say that now that the mainstream ev brands have got on board and i'll throw this out to whoever wants to answer um that uh, tesla will um have to take a back seat and will not be the leading ev brand um that's an interesting one tesla right now uh i'm just trying to think of segments in uh car sectors just across via via um like vehicles as a whole tesla take on that kind of apple role i can't think of a a subsection that's as dominated by one brand as electric cars are by tesla in people's uh minds and imagination and considering where that brand was about 10 years ago, that's quite remarkable because, I mean, I remember half of the people around knew it because they had a Tesla Roadster on Top Gear and everything that went on then and the uh, lawsuits that followed after. And the other half, I mean, I've, they, they'd probably just heard them in your like referenced in uh, other videos or whatever. Mm -hmm. They've barely ever seen one. But then around 2013, when the Model S came along, I feel like that did for electric cars what the iPhone did for phones. Slick and... Um, you know when it has that brand appeal to it that you struggle to pull away from to the point where it becomes a cult? I mean, for want of a better term. Like, um, like people are so, so, so dedicated to their iPhones, their iPods, and they, they, they never want to shift away, and it's just a seamless experience for them. And they buy into the brand. That's what Tesla have going. Mm -hmm. But uh, along with uh, a brand like Apple, you can have a brand like Google. And I feel like in the market for electric cars, it's up in the air for whoever that could be. And I actually think that manufacturers like Mercedes, BMW, etc., that are pouring huge resources into electric cars, it might not be one of them. No, I, I agree on that because Tesla still has the production volumes going for them and many, many of the other car manufacturers aren't that pro-electric cars because they are com basically competing with themselves if they put an EV out there. Whereas for Tesla, it's not like that. And for, say, Google, it wouldn't be either. Yeah. 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 I mean, uh, building cars is hard. And, and building a, a new kind of car, you know, as we've seen with, you know, reports of e-trons catching on fire and, and whatnot. And that's also a lot harder than it is to just kind of keep doing what you're doing. So even though we're talking about a legacy player, you know, that's going to have the um, level of service and dealership availability that people kind of expect when they buy a car, you know, um, and the, the distribution networks and, and things like that all set up, they still have to design and build and, and support this new kind of vehicle. And so I, I, I hate the term Tesla killer because it's a hack, like overused, you know, 
Mm. You, you go back half a century and people will be like, oh, it's a Corvette killer, you know, whatever. <laughs> it's just such yeah. a hack phrase. And possibly and you just get it. You get that phrase everywhere because so anything bad. anything that becomes such a dominant force, it, it, the, the talk always shifts to the killer. Formula One, yeah. the Mercedes killer, oh. uh, electric cars, the Tesla killer, the Ferrari and, killer, whatever else. And it's just so infuriating. Like possibly, Things can possibly, live alongside we, other things. Possibly we need to get away yeah. from using the phrase killer at all because, I mean, there was, a, there was a great conversation on Twitter this morning about how cars are being styled and how uh, performance cars like the Audi RS6, for example, are being styled with narrower headlamps, with you know massive lurking grills the the idea is to make them look like basking sharks and um and and and, and yet yet the, yet the smaller the car gets the friendlier it gets like that little google car they made a few years ago it's it's lovely and like the honda ev and um so the 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 theory is just that uh for some reason you know those performance car buyers and they are usually men want something aggressive to reflect how they think their personality is um <laughs> is, is that is, is that taking the whole toxic masculinity debate too far, or um, is there uh, something in it? I think there's I think there's something in it. It's not um, to that full extent because, like with these cars that we mentioned, the higher performance cars are usually quite longer and wider as well, and that means you could do more with the styling. And higher performance cars have you know, like those little features here and there, you know, like those those little. Um, tricks and bobs that you could i mean you couldn't really put those on a small car like a smart car well actually you could because there's been the brabus editions before but even they were quite thin <laughs> oh my god yeah. i love those <laughs> and, smart and, brabus and, which which brings me brings me on to the uh, smart for two um e trophy which i would love to be part of next season uh, over in italy um S steph uh, is that the kind of thing um you, you said you've you said you've done some motor racing before wouldn't you just love to go over to the Smart E Trophy in Italy? Well, I have some concerns about top heaviness, and having been upside down in a race car before, I can attest that that is not fun. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, what what forms but, of motor racing have you done so far? Well, so there's like the the super easiest kinds of motor racing you can do in the United States are autocross and rally cross. And I like playing in the dirt. It's why I have a very angry Lancer and I love it. It's as angrily styled as you can get on an economy car. <laughs> 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 um, so I, uh, I've, I've done that some, I, you know, I'll take my car to track days. I mean, the Lancer went on track as soon as it was out of its break-in mileage. So that that poor thing has been abused. It's not an Evo. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> and uh, other than that, it's been uh, the 24 Hours of Lemons and Chump Car. And uh, I did a World Racing League race for Jalopnik as well. Um and that one actually had like nicer race cars in it, but it's open to whatever you have laying around, um, even if it's a lemons car. So, um, but well, that was where I got to drive a GT86 with the cup package, like the nice, the the ones that they use. For like the lemons. Vlin used to have a class for it, but I was just like, oh my gosh. This is the new car that reminds me the most of my 944, which 944 being my usual race car, except it's a little faster <laughs> and I need it. <laughs> well, indeed. So. Um, and yeah. uh, for, for, for those of us who uh, aren't steeped in the world of uh, grassroots motorsport, what is Lemons? Um, so, 24 Hours of Lemons is an endurance racing series for cars that cost $500 or less. Hmm. Um, and it was kind of the first of that resurgence of, you know, how can we make racing affordable to the masses? Because you can split a car with several people and split costs. And, and that makes it actually reasonable to hop into racing. Even pe for people like me who are perpetually underemployed and, <laughs> Bro, okay. 
Um, so uh, what I was going to ask uh, Daniel was, uh, obviously you've you've heard all of our stories uh, about driving in other countries. Um, I, I assume you yourself has driven in a, a large number of countries, but uh, um, I'm, I'm really interested to know, do, do you think that other countries need to become more like Norway to become more EV orientated um, with, with their infrastructure? Or is there another way around it? Is it just a question of customer taste changing somehow? I think other countries are on the way of becoming like Norway in this respect. We're just only like a step ahead. So that this is coming, I think. Uh, there's no way back. <laughs> hmm. And um, would would you ever uh, take take an EV out uh, on a uh, cross country trip to another country? Does uh, d- does does doing a road test somewhere appeal to you as an idea? Sure, you just load up on the apps that you need on your phone to charge the car. There's no problem. Uh, distance wise, it's not a problem. Uh, Norway is a long, very long country in in and of itself. You know, if you put your finger on the southern corner and just turn it turn around its axis the northern part hits uh, Rome and Italy so if you drive across Norway we've driven across like an European distance so if you can drive in Norway you can drive in Europe thank you for listening to the eTalking podcast I'm Stuart Garlic and for all the latest content you can go to medium.com forward slash e dash motion and you can also tweet me at e underscore motion fe on twitter Thank you again and goodbye.